Hi there, friends. It's Bill McDonald, the reading and writing doctor. I want you to take a look at my sign, my advertising per se on the upper right-hand corner. It says the right prescription for ELAR and writing by Bill McDonald, writing underscore doctor at yahoo.com. First of all, if you have any questions, you can always email me. The right prescription is a play on words. It doesn't mean it's the only prescription. It's a right prescription. But I want you to know that every single time that I post something, whether it's words or a video, I base all of it on the fact that the Texas Education Agency is my source of inspiration, knowledge, and understanding of how to apply the principles. And those rubrics, scoring guides, TEKS, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, if you're from Texas, whatever your skills are outside of Texas, you have to make sure that everything that you teach is driven by TEA guidelines. Don't make your acronyms force TEA guidelines to align with your methodology, your philosophy of teaching. This is the way my district taught me. This is what our regional service center said to do. This is what our testing coordinator gave us. I did that for my first six years of teaching where I was told this is, this is what has to be on the structure of an essay as a writing teacher. And in my seventh year, I said, no, I'm going to actually read the scoring guides and the rubrics, ask my students to read the scoring guides and rubrics so that we could base all of our writing responses on what they say gets a one, a two, a three, a four in writing, and a zero back then. And now you can get from two different re readers a zero all the way to a five. And so when I finally said, I'm going to do what the scoring guide says, not what a program says or my district says, I went from getting no fours my last year in mission to getting 11 fours in my classroom where the other three teachers only got one for each because they were still doing what the district told them about how to respond to a prompt. And if I'm completely honest, most rubrics do not properly align with the TEA rubric. Most acronyms, not most, many acronyms need to be tweaked to better align with what TEA is asking. So when I left mission and moved to what's known as PSJA, Far San Juan Alamo. There were still a few more years of toss. And I still kept doing what I was doing. I was told by the teachers there and the district, you have to 
do X, Y, and Z in order to score well. You're going to get graded down if you don't do this. And I said, no, I'm going to stick with what the TEA score guide shows me, the bullets that are listed. That's what they ask the students to do. So I'm going to make sure my students do that. And so that first year, my principal grouped our students by ability based on how they performed in third grade. I didn't have the first, second, or third group. I was the fourth group. And I went against the flow, against the grain, so to speak. And I made sure that what I taught my students was aligned with TA scoring guides, rubrics, and specifications. And if you think of the concept of E-L-A-R and writing, you will see that it has some domains. Listening, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Well, I disagree with the start of that before I can listen, before I can begin to read and write, I need to be able to say, I need to look and see what TEA says about things and not just look, but really see. I need to be able to open my mouth and read that content and say, this is, this is going to be my Bible. I better know it accurately so that I can actually hear and listen, the listening component of ELAR. Make sure you're not just hearing, but you're actually listening to those people who are trying to help you. Then you can say, I can apply my students' ability to read scoring guides, rubrics, and student samples. And I did that with my kids before we wrote so that they knew exactly what would get each score point. And if I'm honest, my kids were probably more accurate graders than many adults that I knew, my students. And so even though I had the fourth group that first year at my PSJ campus, I got five fours and a whole bunch of threes. When, in case you're not familiar, ever since Toss, Tax, and now Star, in spite of all the awesome teaching that happens every year or happened in writing in 4th, 7th, 9th, and 10th, about 75% of the students in Texas were getting twos, ones, two and a one, or zeros at the end of every year. To me, that's not quality writing. That's not effective writing if in the end all you're getting because you're not looking at the rubric is the lower spectrum of the scores to take it a little further because most of you this is going to be your first year addressing the extended essay in response to a question about a passage, not a question about your experiences, not a question about life in general. You have to give your students a very specific passage in some genre, genre that's acceptable for your grade level. Then you're going to give them, in short answer, a question that only requires an answer and evidence with TEA in mind. 
But as soon as your kids read the topic, T, they go straight to the evidence, E, and find at least one piece of evidence according to the TEA rubric that you can write in a complete sentence and then be able to say, based on that piece of evidence, here's my answer, here's my response. So whether you're teaching them to restate or repeat or rephrase, all TEA cares about is, did you respond to the question? Preferably in a complete sentence. And did you respond with at least one piece of evidence? So when, back to my history, when the test changed, from toss to tax, and if you are a writing teacher who was a writing teacher back then, you'll know that the writing scores plummeted, okay? But the averages for fours continue to be the same, that only 1% of the kids in Texas every single year in fourth grade were getting fours, one out of a hundred. And so many teachers were being so liberal with their scoring with essays that were not following the guidelines of a rubric for a four, were giving fours and then wondering why they didn't get fours. Well, on personal narratives, they weren't explaining, they weren't developing the experience on expository, they weren't explaining and exploding their ideas with voice and vocabulary, which was what was required to get a four. They didn't have endings that added depth. All they were doing because they were told by their teacher was restating and repeating in their conclusions. And even now in the extended essay, if you look at the rubric, not at your acronym, it says your introductions and conclusions for a three are effective. So whatever you're teaching, in addition to your central idea statement, controlling idea statement, thesis statement, in addition as whatever your students are supposed to start with, it's, if it's not effective, if it doesn't contribute to the overall quality of the essay, TEA says that introduction and conclusion, that introduction and conclusion, if they're not effective, your students will not get a three because that's what it says in the rubric. Effective is not everybody writing the same thing. All 350,000 students in Texas rewriting and repeating and restating because part of that organizational and development rubric says develop your ideas. If you have 10 sentences and five of them say the same thing because of repeat repetitious acronyms, you're not going to do well because you've only got five second sentences of development. If you look at me, my head does not look like yours. My body looks different than yours, and I'm probably wearing different shoes than you. So your introduction does not have to look like mine. It should not look like mine. There should be a variety of responses because my introduction is like my head, my body, my shirt, and my pants are going to be evidence-based explanation. My ending, in order to get the three, has to be effective. When you look down the rubric, how do I get a two? Well, it says, they don't have to be effective. It just says 
you have to have you have to have an introduction, some sort of opening, a and d, a closing, and all they have to do is be present. So you can get the two points for being boring or repetitious or whatever as long as they're there. But don't be surprised if your kids do not get a three on the organization and development point. The other part of that rubric says that throughout the essay that you have vivid word choices. In other words, your kids are putting some thought into their vocabulary that they're writing, that their sentences are meaningful and everything contributes to the overall quality. So back to my teaching, because that year, my fourth group of kids got five fours, the school decided that we were going to do things the rubric way, the scoring guide way. And at that campus, we ended up doing very well every year in terms of our percentages of threes and fours when the rest of the state was getting twos, ones, and zeros. When we switched to tax, we ended up both years that I was there getting more fours in our campus, which was 99.9% .9 Hispanic because my twins were there and 95% economically disadvantaged. In spite of that population and in spite of the fact that we were in a community that was predominantly poor and they were, we were serving a colonia where many of the children lived in one room houses that the families could barely keep their electricity on, had no running water oftentimes. We didn't allow ourselves to make excuses and lower our standards. We said, guys, this is what a zero looks like. And many of you are in zero land right now. Some of you are in la la la, then we've got to figure out how can we get you to one land by the end of the year? How can we get you into two land? And we didn't just do that in fourth grade. We said, let's make sure that all of the grade levels are teaching writing where everybody, when it's time for tests, had to write in complete sentences where at least one of the questions on the tests in the lower grades were open-ended responses to questions. And so when we at our campus we're getting 13, 15, 18 fours, I can't remember now. And the whole district was getting four or five. That's why I ended up being a consultant because they were like, how in the world are you able to do that with that population? I said, well, we didn't make excuses for our population. We just studied the rubric like crazy. We taught our kids to understand the rubric what gets a one, what gets a two, what gets a three. And we would get lots of threes and fours. And so that last year, I was spending a lot of time outside my campus helping other schools with their writing. And even though I was a math minor and I felt like I was better at math and I am better at math, my math program is called Come On Sense Math. But because most schools for my last 30 years have continued to use such rigid 
formulaic approaches to writing, the scores were not reflective because there was a lot of quantity of writing, but not a lot of quality because too many districts have an essay being written every single week. And if I'm a writing doctor, I don't have enough time if I'm having my kids write one every week to be able to look at the x-rays of all my students and say, before we write the next one, boys and girls, let's do surgery, let's do ER, let's take our essays to the editing and revising emergency room so that we can improve our conventions little by little and we can improve the content. And so what I had to decide was, do I stay in PSJ and continue to impact my students or do I go out and help other teachers who want a different way, who want a different approach to writing? So I made the transition for several years. I was a tax consultant and I showed teachers how to get more threes and fours in writing, not settle for twos, ones, and zeros. When it switched to star, it got even more difficult, but the scores continued to stay the same. We're in fourth grade, 75% of the students, all the way up until the time when they stopped writing for fourth and seventh a couple of years ago. They just barely stopped writing in response to a prompt in Engle and, and of course, English one and two this past December. They'll be writing their first response to a passage this April with the rest of you. So whenever I got to work with teachers, many times because they were already used to doing things a certain way, after I left, they would change nothing about the way they would teach, even though what I was teaching them was directly aligned with TEA guidelines and the specifications that said, this is what you need to do well in the area of an essay. This is what you need to do well in editing and revising because those were the three components. And on the new STAR 2.0 test, half of your test points come from writing an essay, eight editing questions in the elementary grades, about nine in middle school and about 11 in high school, eight revising questions in elementary in two passages, about nine in middle school and 11 in high school. And so because half of the test is going to be your student's ability to write an essay, to improve content with revising and improve conventions with editing, unless you work on those things according to the TA guidelines, the kids are gonna still struggle with low scores on the essays because we're more focused on acronyms that don't align with the rubric than we are on what TEA says will allow your students to do well. So as a consultant, I was like, whenever I work with students, while teachers observe, every single time the students in Texas that I worked with got a four, because I've been so richly blessed by God and my faith to him, I went ahead and forwarded that blessing to the students as an outsider 
who is not confined to the restraints of not rewarding for test scores. And the commissioner told me once in an email, we cannot prevent districts from rewarding for test scores. We just don't suggest it because of all the problems that can happen because of parents who want all, all of the kids to get rewarded regardless of how they do. And I agree, we should reward growth. We should reward success. But because my company back then was called May the Fours Be With You, well, if you got a four and I got to work with you at least one day, and many of you know this because you've worked with me in the past, I would send a $50 gift card to your school for every single kid who got a four. Now, because so many students and teachers heard my voice and said, you know what, let's take Bill's approach to writing, to teaching the process of writing, not focusing on the product, Let's work on writing quality essays, not a, not a lot of quantity. The results for those teachers and students was great. And it got to the point be, before we stopped writing uh, a year or two ago, that I was giving between twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars in gift cards to kids in Texas who were getting fours. And if you were the school singular who had the highest percentage of fours of all the schools I work with, those kids got one hundred dollar gift cards instead of fifty dollar gift cards. And there's about two or three teachers that would constantly be winning that award because I wasn't just seeing them one year and never seeing them again. I would work with their students every single year. And so even though the patients were different, the teachers were the same. And I got to keep building on something with those teachers and they would end up getting more and more threes and fours each year. Some of you have messaged me and saying, I've never met you, Bill, but I just really believe in what you're saying and your heart that you're sharing things with. And so I applied your strategies and I got more fours than I've ever gotten before, or maybe I didn't get all fours, but I had a growth of 30, 40%. And that's with teachers only using my materials and my online videos, never meeting me in person. So I may not be the right, as in right hand versus left hand or right versus wrong prescription. But I will tell you this, that Everything that I tell you, type to you, or show you in a video is going to be directly derived from TA guidelines. I'm not going to be subjective to a district. If you ask me to come and work with your students or your teachers, I'm not going to use your teaching philosophy to teach you or your students. If you're bringing me in to come, I'm going to be applying what I've built based on TEA's determination of what a good essay looks like and sounds like. So although I may not be the right prescription, for English language arts, reading and writing, I am a right prescription for both reading and writing. And I just wanna take this time to thank all of you for 
believing in me and truly listening to my heart about the state of affairs. I, I want us to get started on the right foot, not have a lot of teachers creating habits in students because everybody has to write the same way. No, every essay should be like a human where your head has one eye or two eyes, one or two ideas about a topic, but you can write that idea in your way. You can decide how to explain your evidence. You as a teacher can help each student to determine how many examples of evidence that he or she should have. Not everybody has to have the same amount of evidence. Not everybody should have to explain with the same amount of sentences. You might have a fifth grader on a seventh grade ability level. You're not going to ask that fifth grader to give one or two sentences of explanation if he's on a sixth or a seventh grade ability level. You're going to say, sweetheart, I'm going to ask you to try and explain your ideas and your evidence with a little bit more quantity and with a little bit more depth. There's some pro there are some programs out there that will say for each example of evidence, give one or two sentences of explanation. Some will say give for each example of evidence, give one sentence of explanation. Well, that's not development. If you're trying to get threes, don't give too many examples. Have just a couple of examples and teach your students to do their best to explain those to the best of their ability to end effectively. If you taught them to restate the prompt to make their central controlling idea or thesis in the introduction, then I highly suggest you teach them to rephrase. And so I'm only going to show you three things to conclude this video after my research based summer for the last two years, I want to show you some things that I came up with that are in your many binders. If you signed up for one of the Texas training tour, or they're also in your, in your PDF files or in your uh, hard copies. If I came to you in person, if I'm coming to you in the next few weeks, then you can use the digital files until I get to you. All of you from the Dallas training should have already received your hard copies by email if I already got paid for your training. So let me share with you just what I came up with for the short answer and the extended essay. I'm not going to look at any essays today. I just want to make sure you understand where I'm coming from. I took hundreds of hours, and a lot of you asked, asked for this. This is starting on page 35 of the mini reading and writing binder. I said, using the topic as a, as a, as a red light, the answer as the red light, because the answer must relate to the question, the, the yellow as the evidence, I wanted to see every single third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth English one and English two short answer response. And if you've taken the time to look at those, you'll notice that there's only red and yellow because in order to do well on a short constructed response, all 
the state says you need to do is give, look at the topic, T, go straight to the evidence, E, and then you can give me the response, your answer, so TEA. Topic, evidence, answer, response. So after studying those like crazy, I said, you know what? Let me make a generic rubric that shows the students what has to be done in order to get a two. Well, for a two, in a nutshell, this green section says there must be an answer and evidence based on text and if you notice here, a complete response will include at least one piece of supporting evidence from the text. That didn't come from my head. That's on the TEA rubric for a two. Nothing about ex explanation because TEA says short answer is a reading. question. We're testing your ability to answer in a complete sentence using evidence in a complete sentence or two. And we're not going to grade you down on conventions as long as we can understand what you wrote. As long as it's clear that you have an answer and an evidence uh, that's based on the text that respond that, that that relates to your answer and the topic. When you get a one, it says you're either going to have the answer or the evidence. And that's important. Okay. And it has some specific guidelines from TA. What happens if we only have one portion or of the other, whatever. So you can get a zero. So there's a, an explanation here of how to get a zero. And I have a little mini paragraph that I wrote there based on a conversation with a T representative about how they're going to score, human, two humans are going to score those. Okay, so with that in mind, I said, well, let me put on my writing folder base, a basic guideline. What is the prompt red light? What is the question or topic red light for a short answer for short keyword, short constructive response? How do you get a one? There has to be an answer there. There has to be a response. Okay, but that response red light before you can give me that response, you've got to go straight from the topic to the evidence. And there's three different ways that you can write evidence. You can either tell me where the evidence is at, and we can use this portion of extended. Uh, what line or lines are you, are you finding in? Is, is there a certain scene or scenes, what stanza or stanza, sentence, sentences, sections, sections, paragraph, paragraphs? Where is the evidence? Can be there, but it's not required. What is the evidence with or without quotations? Why did I put that? Because TEA showed with the samples that the where is not always required. The evidence in quotation marks is not always required, but the evidence is required, whether you paraphrase it or put exact words. And so if your students do these two simple things, have a sentence that has an answer, have one or two sentences that have evidence that connects to the answer and the topic, then that your kids can get a two. You can't tell the students to have two or three sentences because 
if your student can answer the question in a complete thought and give evidence in one complete thought, they don't need to have three or more sentences because all that's required is the answer and one or more pieces of evidence. Another thing is somebody asked me, and it's a great question. What if the student wants to combine their answer and their evidence into a complete thought using what we call a coordinating conjunction using a comma with one of the fanboys? I haven't seen that as one of the samples yet, but I would imagine because the student did what was asked, there's an answer to the question and there's evidence that responds to the answer and connects to the topic. It just happens to be in a compound sentence with a, co with a coordinating conjunction uh, and, but, or whatever. I would venture to guess that TA will say, yeah, we're going to go ahead and give you a two because you did the two requirements. Your answer and evidence are there. We're not going to count sentences. Okay. So in the open-ended format, you go over to my graphic organizer and I say, okay, now that you're understanding the concept, you're going to say, okay, we're going to get a topic, T, for a topic, we'll call it, and pointing red, what is your response, what is your answer to the question? So you see that I have a T for topic, it could be T for the T, the, the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skill, and in short answer, it's always going to be in the form of a question. And so I'm going to tell you, once they read the topic, red light, stop. Do not answer the question. Do not start restating the prompt words from the question because that doesn't help you. Go straight from the T of TEA to the E. Go to the evidence. And it says in the rubric, all you need is one piece or more. And so you'll read whatever quantity of information that's being asked of you and you will write down those words or phrases so that you can figure out which piece or pieces are you going to turn into a complete sentence that you can use as your evidence, the yellow light. And you can then come back and say, okay, based on that evidence, my response to your topic, your question is this. And so as long as the reader sees that you have both of these, you can get a two. If only one or the other is missing, your students will get a one. If nothing is there, you have an answer that doesn't relate to the topic. You have evidence that doesn't relate to the topic, or you have evidence that doesn't relate to your answer. You're only going to get a one or a zero. Okay. Now, one more important thing. For the short constructed responses, I'm going to go back to the folder for a second. Because they have multi-part A and B constructed responses, where it's the answer to part B is dependent on part A, that means, come back over here, that they're going to give you two multiple choice responses where part A will be the answer and part B will be the evidence. What they said in the trainings is you can have the answer correct, but part B, sorry, you can have the evidence correct, but part B, the evidence is dependent on part A being correct, which means that if the choose students A, B, C, D did not choose the correct response, to the question, the answer, to get their first point, they will not get the second point, even if the evidence 
chosen was correct. Now, on open-ended, short answer, they'll get the point if one of them's there, but for the constructed responses, it does say in the explanation that for to get both points, both parts have to be chosen correctly to get one point only the answer has to be there and the evidence can be wrong because if the evidence is correct but the answer is wrong your students would get zero points for this type of a two-point question okay so Then I said, well, I need to be able to teach teachers. How do I transition from short answer to the extended? Well, as soon as your students see a page like this that has the word essay, E-S-S-A-Y, one, two, three, four, five. They immediately will need to look for what we're going to call the student rubric. It's a very simple guide of what they expect your students to do in order to get one, two, three, four, five points from each reader. And so make sure that if you're assigning an extended essay topic for informative expository or opinion argumentative make sure that those five bullets are there all five and make sure that they have the managing your time so that they can remember to do these things before they click submit so let's quickly take a look what's the difference between informative expository and opinion argumentative informative expository prompts have been having more than one idea in almost all the cases, or even if though it has one idea, it, it's the, the one idea is sort of like in two parts. And so your students have to look closely at the topic and then remember that I've got to clearly have my state my central idea, but just like on the short answer, the idea that they choose has to be based on evidence. And so it's very important that you don't start teaching your kids to be restating the question because there's not a question. The prompts are always going to be uh, in the form of a, of a statement for extended essay, not a question. So you don't need to restate the prompt in the form of a question. That's not what they're asking. They said, Clearly state your central idea, your controlling idea, your thesis, your claim. Does not say clearly state or restate our prompt words. It's never going to say that. It never has in the entire history of toss, tax, or star. And so if your kids have very little words from the prompt, to very many, they don't care. As long as you're teaching your kids that if you're gonna respond with restating, just make sure there's an idea in that statement. You don't need to tell us what the prompt is. We already told our graders what the prompt was. You don't need to tell us again by restating it. So your kids, because writing is hard, if they're presented with two ideas in an informative expository, teach them to tackle one idea at a time, to break it down into two pieces of a puzzle. For the opinion argumentative, it's going to say, write about whether or not this or that. Because of the word opinion, and you see me making an O in right around my face here. Opinion means I've got to decide based on the evidence 
which claim should I make an opinion about which side of the issue should I write about? And because most of you have kids who struggle, tell them, do not make a decision about which side you're going to pick until you read the evidence and say, oh, I can I find more evidence about this part of the weather statement than this part. Well, then your student should probably make a claim about the part that has more evidence. And that way, when they make their claim statement, all of their evidence that they're going to use is going to be that evidence that they found, and they're going to explain that evidence and how it supports. So only uh, eight, ninth, and tenth on opinion argumentative have to uh, do something called identify and refute the counter evidence. If you identify it but don't refute it, then of course, because that's part of the rubric, you won't get all three points, if that makes sense. If you don't even identify or refute the counter argument in eighth, ninth, and 10th, then the rubric states that you'll most likely get a one in terms of what's called the organization and development part of the response. But basically, your students do not need to explain unless they see the word essay and the five bullets, because that's what has to be there. And so make sure that when you're giving your kids in your district essay, extended essay prompts, make sure that the prompt is written in the form of a statement and probably it needs to have two ideas that your students need to write about on the opinion argumentative. It has to be based on text. I'm seeing some of you showing me essays written by students that are about their own experiences. That's not how STAR is anymore. An expository, informative response needs to be an idea that I share with you based on what I'm reading in the text, not what I think about life and my own experiences. You have to give the kids all five of these bullets because that's their guide, that's their map that's driven by the TEA scoring guide and rubric for adults that's just more student friendly. If you do these five things, you have to get a five from two different readers. So unfortunately, because it doesn't use the word introduction and conclusion inside the three bullets, just make sure they understand that in the organization portion, part of their organization has to be what resembles an opening and a closing. So what did I make for that? Well, I looked at the rubric and so I said, let me go ahead and say, all right, let's stop talking about short answer reading and the different types of constructed responses that could be for reading and some of these, two of these could be for editing and revising, which is over here. So all of this half of my folder are, is the writing portion. And so when I'm teaching and modeling expository, informative or opinion argumentative extended essays, essay one, two, three, four, five, I teach your students to go beyond the red light and the yellow light, which is required for short answer only and say, you've got to make sure you yellow, use the evidence to green, develop and explain your evidence by GPSing, by getting pretty specific using your own words. And so if the evidence is the lines, 
then the way you explain the evidence is what we might call writing between the lines. So there's no magic number. Um, let me just show you one more thing. Um, so based on that, then your students need, need some sort of a graphic organizer that's TEA aligned. And so there's my red. What's the purpose? Is it informative or expository or is it opinion argumentative? And I use Wonder Woman because WW, what is the prompt, the topic or the question? Because if it's short answer, I only need to give you answer and evidence, the red and the yellow light. If it says write an essay, then that's going to be a topic in the form of a statement. It will be informative, expository, or it'll be opinion, argumentative. And the word opinion will actually show up in the prompt line. And so as you see here in the introduction, there's structure. So the organization has to have what you would call an introduction and a conclusion, what I call my engine and my caboose. And so informative expository, if they give them a two-part topic, it's like having two eyes that you turn into two ideas. And so the central controlling idea or thesis statement has to be based on two ideas. And you can have a whistle, you can have a wow, you can add something to get my attention, that's fine, but it has to T, tie in, transition, T, transmission, has to connect with your idea and the topic because you're not supposed to just throw random things at the reader when you're typing that don't connect in a meaningful way. It says on the, the threes that everything adds substance and depth to the quality of the response. Everything is effective. And so don't be teaching openings that don't tie directly to the student's idea. In fact, I think that as long as their idea is responding to the topic, it's better to, I don't, I don't like that many of you are teaching the students to ask a question about the topic. Well, there's 150,000 kids in Texas that are gonna do that. That's not effective because that's not coming from your head. It's using up space and it's not a required part of the rubric. So you need to probably start eliminating that because what all what they want is I want an idea from your students' heads based on the topic that we assigned. In order to go from a one to a two, you're gonna say, are you gonna give me some evidence? If you want to, you can tell me where it's at. If you want to, you can put it in quotations or you can leave out the quotations. You can use the exact words or you can paraphrase. And as you're explaining each example of evidence, let's go to the green light. Are you explaining that? And if you are, how many sentences are you spend ex explaining the evidence? Because if all your kids are doing is saying, I'm going to give you lots of evidence. Well, let me show you this guy right here. His name is SpongeBob and he's yellow. He's got lots of evidence E that you can see his little tie. It ties to the topic, but because he has no central idea statement, he has no explanation. All he's doing is giving what's called the summary. If there's nothing in the passage except for text, your students are not going to do very well because they're not asking you to do a reading skill to give us a summary of the text. We want an idea that answers our topic statement about the text then we want you to use the evidence that supports your idea and then to explain your, your evidence. Let me show you another guy. This 
is what short answer might look like if it gets a two that the student says, okay, they're giving me a two part topic. He looks like me in my head. So I'm gonna touch the top of my head. I have this topic and I'm gonna to respond to the topic. I need a two part response. If it's a two part topic, if it was only a one part response, just one thing was asked, then all your kids need to do is say, okay, as soon as I see the topic and it's only one part, I'm gonna go straight to the E, the evidence and decide which for a short answer response, which one piece of evidence or more can I turn into a complete sentence? And then how can I respond with a sentence that's called the answer and the evidence? So I want you to notice that the minion is correct if it's a two-part short answer question. But if this is an extended essay and it's a two-part topic, which most of them are for ex formative expository, and your student has uh, gone straight to evidence and decided which two or three or four pieces of evidence they're gonna use, and they have a great central idea statement, a controlling idea statement, or a thesis statement, but you don't see any explanation at all. If all you have is a whole bunch of evidence, that paper would get a two, most likely, because you have your idea red, you have your evidence yellow, but there's no explanation. And so what I call that is example-tory. And so you might even have an ending. He has his feet, he's standing up but you're still gonna get a two or less for the organization development part because you forgot that you're supposed to actually explain whatever evidence that you throw at me, okay? The third person I wanna show you is this guy. Let's say that he has for short answer, a one idea topic, okay? If he writes his idea and then he explains his idea, he's not doing what's required in short answer. All I need is the idea, red light in a sentence, and the evidence, yellow light, that he's using to support it. And then the same for informational expository or opinion, getting one opinion, as you see here, or the other. He's taking that side of the issue and saying, I'm, I'm gonna make a claim. But if all he's doing is explaining his opinion, but he's never giving any evidence, then he's not going to be doing very well. Yes, he has his feet. He has his caboose's ending, if you want to call it that, but a correct response for extended essay has to have the idea or ideas to get the one, the evidence explained to get the two or the three, and there's no magic number of evidence that your kids have to use but I will say that if the prompt is based on the entire passage, the introduction, the body, and conclusion, your students probably need to pull at least one piece of evidence from towards the beginning, one piece from the middle, and one piece towards the end and say, okay, I'm gonna use that evidence to support my idea. And now I gotta figure out how am I, how am I going to explain each part. So if there's three pieces of evidence, let's pretend like that's your three pieces of evidence that you're going to use in the body, B for body. You'll say, okay, so if here is evidence one, then explaining is writing between the lines that what does that piece of evidence mean in terms of uh, 
what the author's interpretation, what I think the author was implying there. And so for each sentence that your students write to support that evidence, the more explaining is being done. And because part of the points is the vocabulary that your students are using as they're explaining, their vivid word choices, that two slash three can turn into a stronger three because you're saying not only am I going to be giving you the evidence, I'm going to explain it. So when I get to my second piece of evidence, what they're going to check is, okay, you gave me two pieces of evidence. Now in your own words, using what I call the who, what, when, where, why, uh, how technique. And I'll show you that in my, in my, my essays when I model this for you. I just wanted to show you my thought process behind all of this. What the reader is going to say is, okay, on that second piece of evidence, did you take time to explain in a certain amount of sentences, writing between the lines, what that evidence has to do with that evidence and my idea, how it all transitions, how it all connects? Because if you have four or five, six pieces of evidence, but they don't tie to each other, or the idea or the topic, that's gonna hurt the quality of the grade. And so if you say, okay, I need three examples of evidence, then the reader's gonna say, okay, when we read that third example of evidence, whether you explain the evidence before you give the evidence, or if you explain the evidence after you give it, they just wanna see that your students are explaining the evidence because the evidence is on the lines and what your, your kids explaining expository and opinion argumentative is explaining your opinion based on evidence so you're explaining in both cases and you only need to give one side of the issue for opinion argumentative but i would recommend that you would probably teach your students where where is your central idea Maybe you can say, uh, why do you feel that way? Um, and then give me uh, one or two or three examples of evidence, maybe four if you want to, but remember if you're gonna use four, then how are you going to explain that evidence? But then you have to have a conclusion. So in order to get to uh, the three, it says your introduction and conclusion have to be there and have to be effective. So we can't just restate or regurgitate, rewrite or retype everything that we've already written. We got to what I'd call rephrase and reflect. And that's why down here at the bottom of my, of my folder, it says, if I'm a struggling student, I'm going to teach them, yes, go ahead and restate and repeat but I don't think you should be doing that all year. But remind your students that their conclusion is sort of like their shoes and the laces of your shoes are what ties everything together, the topic that, that you've been given, the idea that you chose, the evidence that you decided to explain, yellow and green, and hopefully explode with higher vocabulary your specific supporting sentences that go with it in terms of the way you're explaining it. But you're gonna have some of your kids say, I, since I, I restated or repeated the prompt words in my opening, then in my conclusions, because what original words can I use from the prompt? That's fine. What other words can I use from the prompt? That's your middle kids. What original way can, that's basically what I call the wow. Does your essay have a wow? Some sort of attention getter that ties in with everything? Did I restate? Did I rephrase? Did I reflect? As long as they see a clear central idea statement. So then you come down here to the bottom. And so if you're students that can do it, restated or repeated in the introduction, you're going to say, I want you to rephrase it in some way in the conclusion, say it in a different way. For your higher end students, 
have them do what's called a reflection. Because some of the best responses that I saw in the samples were really high level reflections. In fact, one of them made me cry when I was reading it. So, and then the last bullet has to be there because it says, make sure you check your paper for capitalization, usage, punctuation, grammar, or spelling, and sentences. Sentences as being sentence boundaries that don't have run-ins and fragments. And so revising and say arm, um, before I turn it in, is there anything that I need to add, remove, replace, or move with editing? Is there anything that I need to work on conventions, capitalization, usage, punctuation, spelling, and sentences? Because on the essay portion, all of this hurts your students or helps them because this part is four out of the 10 points and how it's organized and developed is six out of the 10 points. So not only do they need to understand that they're gonna get two passages where they're adding, removing, replacing, or moving things, but they're also gonna get two passages where they're improving conventions of one sentence or at the most two by following one of these three rules that are about cups when it says error or change about run-ons or fragments if it says correct best sentence singular or sentence and fragment fragment and sentence where one of one of the two sentences they're going to ask your kids to look at is a complete thought and the other one's a fragment. But uh, the idea is that when they finish your student, their essay, your students are supposed to apply the same skills that you taught them if you actually taught grammar. Then they'll be able to apply it to their writing. But if you're of the, the groups of people in Texas who say, do not teach grammar skills in isolation. And your kids never got taught grammar skills in isolation by anybody. It has to start somewhere. And so because of the conventions, your kids could get zero points on, on the conventions part, but they still could get two or three points as long as you do the three things that are required uh, on the organization and development part. But if this part, when they're typing, is so indecipherable, so illegible, so uh, incoherent that the reader can't even understand what was added, what the content was, then they would get two zeros, okay? Zeros on the conventions and content part, and zeros on how it's organized and developed in terms of the pieces that are required of a puzzle in a process of expository, informative, or opinion argumentative. So I did not want to show you an essay, even though several of you have asked me to model some of my short answer responses and some of my essay responses, I felt like I needed to give you the foundation because what I did first as a teacher was I studied the rubric like crazy so that I could use my reading skill to understand the TEA documents to make sure that when I move to the next step of writing, I think if you think of it this way, reading comes before writing in the alphabet so reading the rubric should come before writing any essays but your students reading a short answer that you wrote or that was written by somebody else should probably become before they write because that's the whole concept of ELAR but remember it's not just listening, speaking, reading, and writing. It should be looking and seeing, speaking, discussing, talking about it. It's called modeling, mentoring, hearing, and actually listening, 
reading the rubric and student samples that scored well from TEA's perspective, not someone else's. Then saying, okay, now I need to try my best to write. And because we're in February, may the twos be with you. In March, may the threes be with you. And in April, may the fours be with you because it might be too hard now to get to five land, uh, but little by little you can increase the, pro the, the quality. So I apologize for the length of this response, but I just wanted to give you my own perspective based on my prior experiences of wanting to truly understand um, what was being expected of my students in writing so that I can tell you why I frown on anything that's going to lower the quality of the response. If you're going to teach that every single student in your school, in your classroom, in your grade level, in your campus, in your whole district has to respond to every prompt and every topic in the same exact way as each other, you may as well make carbon copies of the first kid who turns it in and just send those into the state. Because all of my human graders who are friends of mine here in this Facebook group have told me they've gotten bored out of their mind because there's nothing effective, effective. You wanna get a three? Make sure that the introduction, the body and conclusion are effective not just present and accounted for. If you want to uh, do your way, not the TEA way, you, you might want to consider getting in a different group because I'm never going to encourage you to tell all of your students to write exactly what the prompt says word for word because that's not what the rubric states. I'm never going to ask all of my students to have their essays look like cookie cutters of each other because the TEA document says for the kids to write their idea and explain it in their way with their evidence. Now, not evidence from their own experiences, but evidence from text. But you should not tell your students how many examples of evidence they have to have, how many magical sentences they have to use to explain, how many sentences that they should start with or end with. There just has to be an introduction and a conclusion. They don't even count off for lack of inventions or what we call typical paragraphing. They just are gonna say, if you're opening in our point of view that's subjective is effective, then we'll give you a three on that part, the organization and develop, development. If your introduction and conclusion are just kind of boring because you did some repetitious approach and so did everybody else, you can get the two. And your students uh, next to you can get the two. But my worry is that if the readers are grading between 100 to 200 papers per day per person, some of those, if all they see is nothing but repetition, throughout the entire essay, just writing the same thing over and over, a lot of those kids are not going to get the twos because the reader is going to be so bored out of their mind, they're going to be like, oh, I can't tell the difference between the evidence and the explanation because uh, it all sounds the same as the previous 50 kids. And what 
uh, happens a lot of times with electronic scoring is because of the barcoding, many of your students in your classroom, in your grade level, in your district are being graded by the same person because the barcoding is numbered. And so in the same way that the paper tests were numbered, there's a barcoding system that allows them to determine uh, where each test response is coming from. So that's basically in a nutshell, my history of why I felt I was going to break protocol and not use a district rubric that didn't align with TEA, TEA's rubric. So it's important that you teach an acronym that aligns with what TEA says will do well and then that when you're done, that you're editing and revising, that you use their essays and say, instead of writing an essay every week and then never having time to give feedback so that the next week's essay is the same quality, we're going to maybe write one a month so that two or three weeks are spent writing each part of the essay because you can teach lots of reading skills you can you can go on to the next passages the next content in your book but if you're going to write an essay the schools who do well that i worked with focused on writing fewer essays well than writing multiple essays poorly because there was an emphasis on quality, not quantity. So I hope that this kind of has helped you see who I am and why I share the things that I do, the way I do it. I don't want to offend anyone here, but if, if you post something on my wall, because it is my wall and my group, if it, doesn't align with what TEA says will do well if it's just a perspective of you personally or your district or somebody from a regional service center but it's not directly in line with what TEA says here's some skills that we're wanting you to teach and in our sometimes warped viewpoint this is how we're going to score what you send us well that should be the bible and everything else should just be a gps that points to that bible not the other way around make sure that the TEA scoring guides and rubrics, either in my binders, if, if you got them, my folders, my outlines that I gave you are aligned directly with TEA. Make sure that whatever you're using is going to help your kids increase their quality over the year, not plateau and stay the same you don't want your kids who can really give insightful meaningful responses to be stuck in a box that requires them to write the same as everybody else because you think that's what they're supposed to do i'm not talking about formula because TA doesn't use the word formula in their rubric this time around. But I'm, a ta I'm talking about what's effective. 
what's meaningful, what's adding depth, and what does not add to the quality or to the depth. Because I need to remove anything that doesn't, and I need to start adding the things that do. So sorry for the novel length post this time, but I just wanted to share from my heart my experiences uh, and I hope that those of you who do understand my point of view and perspective and why I share what I do will have an open heart um, an open mind you know when you when you go to when I ask you tell me a place that sells burgers you can't tell me that you can only go to McDonald's just because your town only has a McDonald's. There's a hundred or more different restaurants that serve hamburgers. There's a hundred or more companies that can tell you a way to teach writing or reading or math. You, you, you have to get out of the box that says we can only teach it this way. We can only use this acronym for everybody regardless of their ability. If or when your students do poorly, it will be because they weren't given an opportunity to excel and push themselves to a higher level of quality on their essay don't just always have your kids who have gifted abilities in writing helping your kids who struggle. That's what we used to do at my campus. And we said, no, let's change. Let's put our two highest kids together and our next two highest, our top 10. We're always helping each other. And those papers that were twos and threes became threes, fours, and fives in terms of quality. Um, and I'm using the number five now because that's the new scoring system for extended essay. So I know it's a lot to, to think about, but I just wanted to make sure that you understood before I showed you some short answer essays that I'll model and some extended essay samples that I wrote based on the central controlling idea or thesis statements that TA shared or some that I wrote completely on my own because I felt like some of the ones that were used were not very effective. Um, hopefully all of this will help you to say, I can, go to McDonald's, but I can also go to Whataburger and Burger King and Dairy Queen because one of the most famous sayings of in the very first page of the book called the six plus one traits of writing, it says there's no one curriculum, there's no one program that can be the, the answer to all of your writing teacher's woes. So I'll go beyond that and say there's no one acronym that everybody should have to use. Because if you're not differentiating your instruction based on what your higher ability students can do, if you're watering down your teaching so that everybody has to write the same way and the same thing in the same order, that's not effective. And I want to the best of my ability and with love be sharing that, yes, we're tired, yes, we're exhausted. Yes, there has to be maybe an easy way for our kids who struggle, but let's differentiate our instruction for kids who have that ability to take that next step to, to write a higher quality response. So, Please be kind in your comments. And when you share this, I am trying my best to 
share based on 30 years of experience. And I don't want this year, our first year in Star 2.0, to all of you, have all of you be shocked or surprised or disappointed if you end up getting lots of papers that on a zero to 10 basis get less than five points because there was a heavy emphasis on repetition and restating when we could have been focusing on depth and quality and effectiveness in terms of what the kids were doing and how they were explaining and how they were writing their central ideas and what that introduction looked like. Because in my last analogy, if your introduction is the appetizer, your meat is the evidence, your vegetable would be the explanation and your dessert would be your conclusion. I don't want to be eating the same appetizer every day as a grader. I don't want everybody to have to tell me that I have to get a Luan platter, that I only get to have two vegetables, that I only can, that I have to have two vegetables. In other words, that I have to explain with two sentences. They can, I can have two examples. I might want to use three examples of evidence this time. Well, that's fine. Just explain all three. I might want to use one example. Well, for an essay, that's a compositional risk. Because if the question, the prompt, the topic is something about an entire passage, an entire selection, I don't think one piece of evidence on the extended essay is going to be enough to cover the content because those two-part questions are written in such a way that it forces your students to go beyond just reading the introduction and coming up with one idea about the introduction. What they're wanting to know is, does this student have an understanding of the entire selection, poem, passage, play? fictional story, literal nonfiction, informative passage. Because we're going to test their ability to respond to an entire essay by the end of the year. God bless you guys. Take care and thank you so much for your patience and watching this all the way through. The first person who tells me they watched it all the way through and got to this part right here. You are welcome to come to my Houston, Austin, or Lubbock training for free. All you have to do is be the first one in the comments section to write, I watched it until the very end. Thank you for my free training. And only one person is going to be the first one. And just know that if, if you feel the need to be, because I am the owner of this group, this club, and I try to focus on empowering and enabling and supporting and being uplifting, if something that you post, not just here, but anywhere in my group is negative or condescending or demeaning of, of anyone, even yourself or your administration or students or the test. Like we already live in a negative world. And so make sure that you use caution. There's wisdom in silence. If you don't like what I have to share, then I, I want to just politely suggest that maybe you join a different group because I only want to teach the right way for the right way. And like I said, it's a way, but the way that I've come up with 
is based exclusively on my study of TEA and their documents and how I can best help you teachers. So please be positive in all of your comments at all times. Uh, I will respond to positive, encouraging and uplifting posts or comments. And I will, I will let you ask questions, but I won't let anybody post anything that's derogatory, negative or demeaning of anyone or anything or any content. Uh, I will remove it. And if I feel I need to, I will block you from, from my group just so that the group can continue to stay positive and encouraging and uplifting. No one has to buy into what I'm sharing. I just felt like I needed to take this time to share my background, where I'm coming from, uh, and why I feel it's so important to teach quality writing, to not focus on worksheets, to sometimes get off the sheet and let kids use their eyes and their ears and their mouth and their hands to make a total physical response connection to things. Thank you so much and God bless you for taking the time to listen to this very long video. Goodbye.